Welcome to the Rumi Forum. My name is Dan Rizza, and I'm the moderator of today's session entitled Climate Change, a Major Challenge of the 21st Century. For several years, I've worked in the climate change and energy technology R&D field, during which time I've had the distinct honor of working with the guest of today's program on initiatives related to the establishment of the Advanced Research Project Agency for Energy, ARPA-E, and sea level rise, among others. Today, we are fortunate to be joined for a discussion on the science, impacts, risks, and challenges of climate change by a pioneer and seminal thinker in this field, Rafe Pomerantz, who has a distinguished career reaching back over 30 years. For decades, Rafe has worked effectively in and out of government to call attention to this issue of climate change and to keep it in front of the nation's decision, decision makers. Um, from 1993 to 1999, Rafe served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, uh, and previous to that, he served as President of Friends of the Earth, as a Senior Associate at World Resources Institute, and as Chairman of the League of Conservation Voters. Currently, Rafe serves as Senior Advisor and Fellow at the Climate Policy Center of Clean Air, Cool Planet. Welcome, Rafe. I'd like to start the session by asking you to introduce the topic. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, we've just experienced a big heat wave in the D.C. area, so people's attention is on the, the weather. Uh, well, as Dan mentioned, I've had about 30 years of experience on the climate change issue. Uh, in all aspects, really, science, policy, diplomacy, uh, politics, it's a vast subject. And um, uh, where to start? Well, uh, let me put it this way. Human beings have their hand on the thermostat of the Earth. We control the, the planet's temperature now. And the way we do that is by changing the composition of the atmosphere. The atmosphere had a natural background level of carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution. And those gases trap heat in the atmosphere and keep the Earth at the temperature that it was, or kept the Earth at the temperature that it was. Uh, what we are doing through various activities is changing the concentration of those gases. So carbon dioxide, for example, in the pre-industrial area in the era in the 18th century had we were about 280 parts per million in the atmosphere. Now we're close to 400. Methane has gone up uh, exponentially as well. And water vapor responds. The more heating you have, the more water vapor you, uh, enters the atmosphere through evaporation and it, it is a positive feedback to the whole system. It just creates more heating. So, uh, simple way to think about it, all combustion of fossil fuel produces CO2. It's the main by byproduct, carbon dioxide. So we as a society, a global society, are emitting vast, vast quantities of this. It's the largest waste product on Earth. And carbon dioxide has a very long lifetime in the atmosphere. And so what has happened is that we, human beings, have built up an enormous increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. And all the models, that is the experiments by computer, all the study that the scientific community has put in, has predicted that with increasing concentrations of CO2 or carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases, the Earth's temperature will rise. I remember back in 1979, the National Academy of Sciences predicted that with a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere, the Earth's temperature would rise about uh, three degrees centigrade, plus or minus a degree and a half. And the estimates haven't changed all that much since. Uh, th that's the approximate range. And Absent some correction to our activities on this planet, we will reach doubling and beyond. We will put the planet through the climate ringer. And uh, those predictions are then accompanied by all the, the prediction of a global temperature change due to the change in the composition of the atmosphere. 
as I said, the atmosphere then traps, those molecules trap heat. That's well understood, it's well measured. That's the fundamental problem. It's pretty simple. You uh, change the composition of the atmosphere, you trap more heat, the temperature goes up. That's a thermostat. But that's sort of the easy part of the problem. The Earth then warms up, and indeed the Earth has been warming steadily, particularly since the late 1970s. Uh, when it started an uptick, and that uptick has been going on since. Last year was tied for the warmest year on record. The last 10 years are the warmest decade on record. So, and what's changed since I started on this 30 years ago is that the, the indicators of warming have become apparent. In other words, back then it was sort of a theory. Not sort of, it was a well understood theory, hypothesis that changing the atmosphere would change the temperature. Well, about that time, the Earth started to warm rapidly in the late 70s, and it has continued. Some people think it's natural variability. Well, if it was natural variability to expect the temperature to fall back to sort of the average of the past 100 years or something, that hasn't happened. Uh, and in fact, the warming is consistent with the prediction. So. Uh, just to say one more word about this thermostat. So you put the, the gases in the atmosphere and then they trigger feedbacks. I mentioned one important one, more water vapor. That's a greenhouse gas. So you, put, you heat things up, you get more water vapor, warms things further. You melt ice and snow. They've been melting land-based glaciers for a couple of decades now. And the big thing that's happened in the last decade or more, well, is that the Arctic, the ice that has covered the Arctic Ocean at all times of the year has begun a vast retreat. And in fact, this year, in the last uh, report, was that the ice cover of the Arctic Ocean is running at the lowest level ever recorded, even less than the radical year of 2007. So we're losing Arctic ice. Well, when you lose Arctic ice, you, you lose reflectivity. And that reflectivity cools the planet. Now it's an exposed ocean that absorbs heat. So that makes the planet still warmer. In other words, the black o free ocean absorbs heat, whereas the ice-covered ocean reflected that heat back to space. And uh, so we're losing what's called the albedo or reflectivity of the planet as well. The third, probably least understood fee feedback that enhances all this is uh, clouds. Some cumulus clouds tend to be more reflective than absorbing heat from the surface of the Earth, whereas cirrus clouds at a high altitude tend to absorb much more heat than they reflect off the top of the cloud. So that's a third feedback that's supposed to, or in the models, warms the Earth. Uh, is a positive feedback warming the Earth even more. So you have three, water vapor, ice, and clouds. Those are three big feedbacks. So there we are. We've changed the composition of the atmosphere. We're adding greenhouse gases to it all the time in massive quantities, billions of tons per year from all the combustion worldwide. And that's warming the Earth. Okay, so are we seeing any effects? I mentioned the Arctic sea ice disappearing. Well, I'll give you a couple more examples. In the world's oceans, coral reefs exist in a certain temperature threshold. When the oceans warm too much, which they have been doing, and it, w w let me back up. When the ocean, as the ocean warms, coral is affected. And what happens is the heating sort of bleaches the coral. It, uh, the, 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 the reefs become too hot and a coral animal expels algae which is its nutritional source. Uh, if the water stays, it expels the, the algae because it's too hot. If the water stays too hot, the coral will die. And we have seen massive coral death in many regions of the Earth, particularly in the Caribbean, and in the Southern, the Southern Pacific, Indian Ocean, and even some bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. That's another signal of warming. Uh, a third one I might mention, or a second, is of course that the oceans are rising, sea levels rising. And yeah, I was going to ask you, what are the main impacts of climate change? Why should we be worried about this? Right. Well, <laughs> these indicators are impacts. So let's say 
we don't know whether coral will survive the warming planet. Will there be any reefs left? Well, reefs have the world's, one of the habitats for a massive amount of the world's biodiversity, just like tropical forests. Well, we're on the verge of going over the cliff on the reefs through the bleaching phenomenon. Uh, second impact and indicator, sea level rise, as you, uh, you ask. Uh, sea level rise occurs because the oceans warm, their volume expands, that's first. Second, we melt mountain glaciers, typical glaciers uh, in the mid-latitudes, in the tropics, in the high latitudes, mountain glaciers move fresh water into the ocean. The biggest source, the most uncertain, but which has begun to change radically lately, is the, are the ice sheets in Antarctica, Greenland. Here, massive amounts of uh, ice exist, have existed in a frozen state, of course, for thousands of years, millions of years, and we are pushing the system outside the, the range that we've experienced in literally in millions of years. So that is beginning to have, the warming to date is beginning to have an effect on the ice sheets. In Greenland we're seeing a shrinkage actually the ice. Now why is that a big deal? Well Greenland has enough ice on it to raise sea levels by five meters worldwide. Antarctica, the West Antarctic ice sheet can raise sea level by seven meters or so and the west of East Antarctica has dozens of meters of sea level rise. So we are actually faced with now based on the latest estimates by the glaciologists and others we've worked with, the inundation of various parts of the world. Which okay. parts? In the well, US? any place that's low-lying is, uh, is uh, at risk. And to give you examples here at home in the United States, uh, we've done a lot of work on uh, East Coast uh, situation. And probably the most vulnerable area with the most with the most at risk is Florida. Uh, Florida, of course, everyone knows, is, has a massive amount of infrastructure and population right on the coast. The coast is very low lying; it's sort of at sea level or just above. But it's compounded by the geology on which all this development rests, which is limestone. Limestone is porous, so as the sea rises. The limestone that will just move the water inland and the, gradually the water table will rise, Florida will be inundated. So you can't build seawalls? No, you cannot. The Dutch will not have business in Florida because the, you cannot build a seawall on limestone. That means you can't build a seawall around Miami or Tampa or St. Petersburg uh, or Fort Lauderdale. So the, it, it, Florida and many other areas of the East Coast are at risk, different impacts depending on the geology and on the infrastructure systems. But we are now looking at, most estimates have a, a, a meter of sea level rise, more than three feet by the end of the century. And it ha the ocean has begun to rise more rapidly and you can see lots of effects even at small amounts of sea, the few inches we've seen so far. So. If we don't act and we don't bring a halt to this, the sea level rise problem will just continue. Well, maybe this is a good time to ask you what are some of the, the policy <coughs> issues surrounding this issue? Um, right. yeah, I can't think of, uh, you're one of the best people, I think, to talk about this because of your long career in this um, area. So yeah. uh, maybe you can give us some insight in, into where we right. have been, where we are. Just, just before we get into that, let me just say a, a word about uh, two more impacts and then okay, we'll go to the policy. Good. One is um, we are seeing now massive dieback of the forests in the Rocky Mountains. Massive. Millions of acres of forests are dying. They're dying because the winters are too warm and uh, that has triggered a proliferation of, a, of a, something called pine bark beetle. <coughs> other bark beetles or other beetles <laughs> in the, that kill trees because they're not killed by the cold winter. And uh, this is a profound change in the ecology of the West. And what's going to happen to these massive amounts of uh, dead trees, soil erosion that follows fire, unprecedented dieback of those forests. And so um, 
Finally, as another example, I might mention the fact that one of the classic outputs of all these models is that the, the, the Earth will heat, cities will experience longer heat waves because we're going to see more 90 degree days, more 100 degree days in places that experience just a few now. And notice the average high temperature in the summer is going to go up and that's going to make it tougher on people to live in, in the warm pla the places that are pretty warm to begin with and it's just going to continually get warmer. And I think what's important to understand is that this doesn't stop. This just keeps going and as the concentration of these gases increases in the atmosphere. So as the world gets wealthier, uses more fossil fuel, uh, the heating just continues. That's the projection. And uh, there's a lot we don't know about what will happen. We'll be constantly surprised. The coral bleaching phenomenon was a surprise. Everybody knows that ecosystems will change because they're all temperature uh, dependent. And, or in the, in the, and they're dependent on precipitation. So you know that as you change the heating, temperature range, things, the entire natural world will change. Okay, policy. Uh, well, can I ask you, yeah. how will these impacts affect our economy? I mean... Um, That's a, a good question. I think, well, sea level rise is, a, is an example of, uh, of a problem that will have an enormous economic impact because the infrastructure costs of moving, moving infrastructure and big populations, that's a, that's a huge cost to society. Uh, and I think we're just beginning to come to terms with that. You know, in Alaska, whole villages have had to be moved because there's no more sea ice, so the storms on the Arctic Ocean bring huge wave action into the coastal areas that have never experienced soils are very mm, weak they rapidly erode so these native villagers villages have had to be moved at great cost that just a that just a starter when you look at florida which has 10 million people in south florida you look at the maps the projections what happens there nobody knows but uh we're just beginning they're, they're just beginning to do uh, uh, the analysis of what what the uh, infrastructure costs will be. So uh, another area, whole area of impact is a change in hydrology. Right. Uh, that's a, it's a very difficult to pr predict with precision, but where rain falls, where droughts exist, for how long, floods, all that changes. But the regional predictions occurs on a regional scale are not very good. Um, the one area that's quite robust, however, seems to be the American Southwest. And the, and the, the sense that what the models suggest is that it could easily get into a state of permanent long-term drought, which could last for centuries. Now, that has happened in the past. I mean, when the climate changes, areas that were dry can become wet or they can become drier. And they, it, so things can change radically for long periods. So we, we face uh, a highly uncertain future on what the planet, what, what the land and water systems of the country and the world will be. So given all this, how can we address this? Well, this is, a, this is something that many of us have been working on for many, many years. Uh, uh, and we have, it's been a long struggle to get this issue on the table for policymakers, a lot of education. We're not done with that, obviously. It has to continue. But it's, uh, we're faced with one of the largest transitions ever imagined. Uh, what transition the, the is that? The transition is from a fossil fuel-based economy or a carbon-emitting economy to one that doesn't emit carbon. Now, there are all kinds of technologies that are possible substitutes, but they have one common characteristic. They're, they're uh, more expensive than coal use at the moment, most of them. And coal use is key supplier, coal's key fuel for electricity. So in order to substitute for coal, which by the way produces about twice the carbon dioxide per unit of energy as methane, 
uh, which is another uh, as natural gas, I should say. Um, coal is a huge fuel in the world, produces use mainly for electricity. It's big in China, big in the United States, big in Russia, many other countries. And yet coal use is, produces an enormous amount of, of carbon dioxide, as does oil. Oil is sort of in between natural gas and coal. So you can imagine there has to be a transition on the, transi on the transportation side, on the electricity side, and many other areas of society. So A, when you think about a comprehensive approach on the CO2 problem, we need amazing boost, in it, not amazing, but a large scale boost in R&D, research and development for transformational Clean technology. Clean energy R&D. Non-carbon. Non-carbon R&D. I mean, what the clean, in, this, in this case, what clean energy means is non-carbon based. Now, that could be nuclear, can be wind, can be solar, or could be even coal, where the emissions are sequestered in the ground. So, uh, so we've really got, there are two, say, let's say, fundamental things we need to do with regard to fossil fuel. We need to price it so it reflects the real damages to society known as externalities. That means using a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. And uh, the difficult politics of a tax which creates the incentives for people to move to other choices. In other words, when you price it, you get a more expensive fuel, people will do something else. That's the cheapest way to do that. But right now in our society, there are many political leaders who say no new taxes of any kind. Well, we need to use energy pricing as a response to climate change. So we have to get used to the idea that we have to spend more on energy. It's got to cost more, relatively speaking, carbon intensive fuels than non-carbon fuels. There has to be a differentiation based on the output of carbon. And I think part of the policy program is we have not faced this issue squarely. We haven't said to the American people, energy has to cost more, particularly carbon-based fuels. And if we don't do that, couple that with a major R&D effort to get lower cost substitutes, then the CO2 in a, will continue to rise, the earth will get warmer, the damages will get greater, and we will gradually lose control of the thermostat because there are a set of feedbacks that are sort of runaway feedbacks that may occur, so we would not, no longer really control the atmosphere or have the ability to control the content. <clears throat> so energy pricing is a key element. The political problem is that if a politician raises the specter of taxation, they, they set themselves up as a target for their opponents because the, they get attacked for taking money out of people's pockets. Well, this has to change. You can refund the tax, you can lower other taxes with the revenue, you can use it for deficit reduction, but the fact is that we, this has to be done. It's a component of the, of the it's not the only piece, it, a comprehensive policy has a number of pieces. I'm identifying a couple. Transformational R&D, we've now created a new institution of government called the Advanced Research Projects Administration Energy that's focused on using the techniques of the advanced research program at the Pentagon to produce transformational energy. So that's another key component. Uh, third, we need a lot of information out there for people to be choosing the most efficient technologies. And um, that said, we are so, the system has been pushed so much already. We need a government R&D program on something called geoengineering. Because we are faced with the prospect of... And if what, we, what is geoengineering? Well, the, the idea is that you have to sort of engineer the temperature of the Earth to control things because they couldn't get out of hand. And we will say, we have no tools to control the temperature of the Earth. It's just gone. We have lost control. And that's going to be devastating. So ge what geoengineering about is to change the composition of the atmosphere so that there's, an, there's a sort of an offsetting reflectivity in the atmosphere to all the heating molecules we're putting up there. Uh, volcanoes, big volcano like Pentatubo, put enough particles in the stratosphere to reflect enough sunlight that it cooled off the earth. 
I say this because a lot of scientists are contemplating that this for fear that we don't get our act together around emissions. And uh, so that's another component, that's a precaution in all of this. It's, it, we don't know if we have such a tool. Um, we could do a lot about the other gases. We've taken chlorofluorocarbons are regulated under another an international treaty. They're powerful greenhouse gas used for many industrial and ho household uses. Where they are being phased out. They're a big greenhouse gas. Is that gas. a treaty that you worked on at the State it's Department? It's called the Montreal Protocol right. to protect the ozone layer. Methane is a big greenhouse gas. We know a lot about ways to control that. This is a problem on which the global, so global society has to be mobilized. The issue right now is you've got the sovereign debt crisis in the world, in Europe, in the United States, where ours is not called a sovereign debt crisis, we have a debt crisis. We have a, two wars, we have you know, the revolutions in North Africa. There's a lot to kind of divert the attention of policymakers to, and, and the world. Unfortunately, we have to stay with this and at it in order to turn Right. Change course. It seems to me that this is an issue that um, the longer we wait, the harder it is to. Yeah, to and solve. that's where we we have gotten. Right. You know, people keep saying, "Oh, there's time. There's time. We're at the end, but there's still time." Well, we've already begun to experience impacts. The bleaching of coral is just one. Sea level rise is another. You know, down in Florida, they drain the central part of the state through a system of canals. The freshwater falls in the tropical storms and the floods the central part of the state. They drain it through freshwater canals that, by gravity. Uh -huh. It's a massive system. I think it's 20,000 miles. Well, as sea level rises, the, the, the flow, to, it doesn't work. Or it will stop working. The, the drainage system of Florida stops. So they're contemplating in Broward County, where Fort Lauderdale is, of building these massive pumps to pump the water out into the Atlantic Ocean. So we're all seeing effects. The Rocky the Mountain Forest yeah. death. So, it's, it's wrong to say we've got time. We're already in it. We are already in it. And the question is, how do we cut it off before there is uh, too much uh, damage or before the whole thing gets away with us, away from us? Because, uh, for example, in the Arctic, massive amounts of carbon in the form of, well, carbon and methane are stored. And as the Arctic warms, those, uh, the vast amount of that carbon can be released into the atmosphere as either methane or CO2, which will create a kind of an uncontrollable positive feedback. A feedback, right. And uh, it's that kind of thing, you know, you could stay up nights if you wanted to. Uh, but, so we have to be busy with this, very busy, very intent, and it's a tough problem because Carbon fuels are key to the world's economy. And you, so you get, that's why you have to have the substitutes, more substitutes, pricing. You need the tools right. to. So because the, the economic element is so important in everyday politics nowadays and on the minds yeah. of everyone, could you talk a little bit about what happened during the whole cap and trade debate the past few years? Yeah. Um, and perhaps some. Uh, you've already mentioned some of the economic mechanisms that we right. need to move forward, but what, what was learned and, and um, how do we create momentum? Well, how do we as bring uh, in most people know, last year we had a massive debate in the Congress about this. Uh, the President backed something called a cap and trade program. A version of it passed the House. Nothing happened in the Senate. It crashed, and I think it set back the issue of a substantial U.S. policy for a number of years, at least. And um, I would say the first thing is that any, S sorry. How, how, how can we bring in, it seems to me that there are lots of political players across the spectrum and how can we bring them all together? Yeah, well that's again. what I was going to say. <laughs> the first thing that has to happen is that there has to, what has to develop is a bipartisan leadership core can't do this issue is a dem the last two big issues have been basically democratic doesn't work because the republicans resist because it's the democrats and because energy pricing has been involved i speak of the btu tax back in 93 and the cap and trade program so the democrats cannot walk out on this by themselves republicans have to embrace the issue and become leaders 
Many of us who've been working on this have tried to invoke the use of market mechanisms which are the most efficient to reduce emissions. And it, I would say simply, you could go on for hours about the cap and trade mm. debate. The problem of partisanship or lack of bipartisan support was key. I think the bill became too complicated and potentially costly. There's another problem in the House. Uh, I think the White House did not guide the process sufficiently in terms of the details, the architecture. But I think fundamentally a lot of the senators hadn't embraced the issue sufficiently to make major national policy. So we have a lot of work to do still. Understood. Well, if it's okay with you, I think I'm going to open up uh, the floor for questions and see if Good. people in our audience have questions for yeah. Rafe. Right here. My name is uh, uh, Ziad al Um I'm an energy specialist and former director of operations at the World Bank. Huh. Um, excellent. Um, I, I like what you have raised. Uh, I know this requires, uh, I think, uh, uh, 10 weeks of talking rather than just a half an hour. And right. each of the questions you've raised, of course, has got many, many points. Right. Um, I just want to put one thing in perspective and then ask you a specific question, if I may. Um, on the U.S. role, I think that's very, very pertinent because we should also say that what less than half, the 5 percent of the population of the globe Right. And we produce 28% uh, of the world's pollutants and consume, I think, 32% of the world's energy. Um, so I think that puts into perspective uh, a lot of the emphasis on the policies that you have been speaking. And I hope something moves. It's extremely important for the U.S. and for the rest of the world. For my question, I go back to um, Al Gore and the inconvenient truth. Um, if I understood his message right with that, graph, he, 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 dramatic right. graph he, he produced, that the rate of melt of the uh, Greenland ice cap uh, would be a, a, de a determinant, a very important determinant um, for what happens in the North American um, continent and by extension to other parts of the world. Um, and I understood that the figures that he gave in his presentations uh, were in fact lower than what had actually happened. Mm -hmm. Can you shed some light on that, what the figures uh, well, are like? Well, uh, that's a good question. Greenland, you know, in this issue, mm -hmm. Greenland wasn't talked about much in the early years of this, uh, at least the first 20, 25 years that I was involved. Yet it was known as a major potential source of sea level rise because of the amount of ice. That was understood. But nobody thought it would melt or mm -hmm. start to shrink. And it has, and uh, it's, it's doing so for a reason that wasn't really anticipated. The main reason is that the oceans are warm. A lot of warm water, of, uh, ocean water, is invading the fjords of Greenland where these big land, these uh, terminal, um, glaciers are uh, based in the water. And uh, is, melting them from the from the ocean back. So we're seeing this big retreat and you can look at the satellite data is, and we have uh, worked with a lot of glaciologists on this. So I think what happened is that the movie that Al Gore made was was really put together before a lot of this data. This is the last five years. And that, this dynamic, uh, as I understand it, wasn't even incorporated in the 2007 IPCC Well, there was a big uh, debate in the uh, international scientific assessment about what to say about Greenland and Antarctica. Well, now the glaciologists are out there observing massive changes to both places. And the issue of understanding the role of the ocean, the warmer ocean, is critical. So uh, most of the analysts now I don't know that there's a consensus. I just say most think that because of the enhanced contribution to sea level rise from the ice sheets, that we're going to get a meter, say, instead of half a meter by the end of the century, and then it continues. So there has been a dramatic change to the behavior of the ice sheets, and I actually think that that is a, it has to be understood, it has consequences not just in the U.S., but the whole world. And uh, right now, the United, just back to your first part of the question about U.S. policy, I, could, I might differ with you about how much of the world's carbon we're emitting. It's still, we're second to the Chinese now, but still, it's huge. Doesn't really matter. 
we, our hands are tied. When the United States goes to international negotiations, I mean, we can help create a better process, we have great ideas, but we have no substantial domestic authority to control emissions. The Clean Air Act, yes, we could control, but that's marginal. It's not well designed for controlling carbon emissions. So our negotiators have very little room because we have learned you cannot commit internationally until you have domestic authority in advance. That's the problem. We in the United States do not have the political will yet to make a major dent in the problem. We've sort of, we've worked on the edges. We've gotten a long way in terms of education, debate. You know, the Capitol Hill, they probably had a thousand hearings on this subject, but it hasn't amounted to a real policy yet. Great, are there any other questions? Okay, right here. Hello, I'm, <coughs> I'm Denton Barron. I'm a student at Davidson College. I was wondering, um, you talked a little bit about transitions, and I think one of the major transitions we're seeing these past several decades have been the transition from developing countries to developed countries. Um, and as we know, that contributes significantly to um, carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. How can the U.S., um, as you said, domestic change wasn't really uh, a, a useful tool at this point, how do you think we can reconcile those priorities? Well, I think there are a couple ways that we can work with uh, the developing, oh, we do a lot of work in the developing world on this through USAID, through the Environmental Protection Agency and others. I would say there are a couple ways we can, we can be particularly effective. One is uh, through the sharing of, of helping to build capacity for policy making in other countries. You know, in order to make policy, regulations, pricing, whatever, you gotta have the capacity, the people to do that, the understanding the systems internally. I mean, if you want to regulate emissions in Vietnam or India or wherever, they gotta have the governance to do that. And, and they kind of, they may or they may not. I'm not an expert in this. So capacity building is one thing. The second thing is creating financial incentives for the world's corporations and businesses to, to, to do the right kinds of projects in the developing world. And, that was in the Kyoto Protocol. There was a major instrument developed called the Clean Development Mechanism, which essentially gave credit to developed countries that did emission reductions in developing countries. That's a th The third l thing that can be done is to lower the, t the trade barriers. That has to happen in those countries and for the transfer and trade in low emissions technology. The tariff system and on many technologies is a uh, is a disincentive and the R&D business I talked about transformational R&D the development of substitutes that can be traded and sold globally is key so thank you um, other questions given that our policy is based upon faith-based economics and increasingly money from American corporations dominates American elections and American corporations, more than those in most of the world, have a very short-term view of the need to make profits. How is it conceivable that any of what you're talking about is going to happen before an awful lot of awful stuff happens? It would seem that you're gonna have to see Lake Okeechobee <laughs> join the Atlantic before there'll be any action. It, the things you've mentioned from the Heinbark beetles to the glaciers to the sea level rise and the coral reefs, everybody's noticed that. And it's all poo pooed by uh, radio talk show hosts. How is it conceivable to you that the United States, how can we guide Vietnam when we can't make policy ourselves? Well, it's a great question, and we're struggling with that now. Uh, I, I think that those of us who, we, uh, our side of the issue, the proponents of action, have to be much better organized. No question. We failed, the, the failed in the Congress. I think they could have, that there was some overreach on the side of, 
people wanted something to get done, but uh, this is a political question now. And I mean, if the science is robust, it's certainly robust enough to say there's massive risk. And the evidence is mounting that that, that, that risk is there. Uh, well, I've already sort of dealt with that. I don't know the answer to your question other than we have, we have to build... Of ignoring some Pardon? We have a solid and enduring record of ignoring such science. Well, here we are. Uh, we're six days away from uh, oh. default in the country. <laughs> it, 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 everybody knows that there's a massive cost to doing this. Catastrophic cost, potentially. Uh, and yet, we're only six days away. So we got a governance problem here. Uh, we uh, and uh, we uh, so uh, well. Let, wait, the debt, the, but the debt problem has mounted over time. So the can got kicked down the road. That's what we're doing on this. And but the problem with this is, you can't, the, you cannot turn the corner quickly. It takes a long time. So we have a problem, and you have to. The only response is to say that. The pe if people who understand this and care about it have to be better organized. That's a simple answer. It's a political question. You have to out-organize the other side. One more question? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Cynthia Butler. I'm an attorney here. But I'm, I'm wondering, are there any good bipartisan nonprofits that you work with that you would hold up as models that could be interfacing with Congress in a more effective way? Are they more funding or better leadership? Well, our, 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 our uh, nonprofit, Clean Air, Cool Planet, and the Climate Policy Center piece of that, we're bipartisan. Working with uh, both parties, we produced a bipartisan bill in the House uh, known as the Udall Petri Bill several years ago that was a cap-and-trade bill that actually had a lot of very fine, it was a good, but it was seen as too weak by the left. And uh, so it, it never went anywhere. Um, the Bipartisan Policy Center worked on a bipartisan basis for this. Uh, I think everybody now who, who, there's a lot of recognition that we have to do this in a bipartisan way. You cannot bring policy on this subject to the floor, a significant policy of either body without Republican leadership. The incentive is not there for Democrats to do that because they get either clobbered or defeat beat. You gotta show people there's a winning way. That means you have to persuade, Repu you know, it was a few years ago, John McCain was a major leader on this issue. Our group worked with him in New Hampshire when he was running for president. And he was terrific on the subject of climate change. But he's disappeared from the issue. In part because part of the Republican Party has become uh, denialist. They don't claim that it's, a, it's claim the, literally claim the issue is a fiction. So maybe that's one of the reasons. But uh, you know there have been a number of Republican leaders on the Senate side, and but they're not enough. They're not vocal enough. Lindsey Graham, who fro flirted with this for a while, got pummeled in South Carolina because he showed some interest in this. How do you see this issue playing out in the election, in the primaries coming up? Well, it's interesting. In New Hampshire, <laughs> the most interesting thing to me is, first of all, you had people like Palenti who kind of backed off. He did a lot when he was governor of Minnesota, but because of the Republican base at the moment, he thinks he has to back off. Mitt Romney, on the other hand, said, this is for real. I'm not going away from this. This is a real problem. So he decided not to move to a more skeptical position. Interesting. Um, any other questions in the audience? You know, one of the things you said uh, in, in your earlier presentation uh, about R&D and R&D, uh, yeah. and I think that's uh, very pertinent. The moment you put in more money into R&D, um, your scientists get at it, and you get a, you get a response to the, to the policies. Um, and also, we've seen this uh, in the past, that if you look at the, if you plot a curve of uh, the cost per kilowatt hour generated by uh, solar cells, photovoltaics here, um, you'll find that the graph declines at a time when there's a perception that oil is running out. That's when the money flows actually towards R&D in these areas. So there's a track record of that kind of response. So for the future, going ahead, this becomes an extremely important uh, subject. 
Now, you, you mentioned China. We talked about, about China and, and the U.S. China, of course, has over a billion people, and the uh, U.S. has one third. Uh, I understand China is putting in a lot more into R&D research in terms of absolute number of dollars uh, than the U.S. is. Uh, and I think uh, here's where you have perhaps the biggest brains <laughs> waiting to do their bit. Right. Um, again, I, I do understand the political situation and what's driving it. And one has to go back to Obama's first budget in which he allocated a substantial amount for R&D, right. yep. which is very great, well, right. I must say. Um, it kind of fizzled out. Um, again, I s understand the issues which are facing the country today. But is there any hope of reversal, specifically on R&D, not the other aspects, uh, of getting into that area? Because well, without that... R&D should be the easiest thing to do politically. So I, so I see, yes. Except that there's a part of the governing party in the House of Representatives that is targeting climate-related expenditures. And... Uh, Um, plus, probably more importantly, is the, that the, the, the deficit and debt issues are driving a contraction of what's called discretionary spending. Non-entitlements, uh, you know, not the Pentagon, not Medicare, not Social Security, um, and the problem we're faced with, the discretionary is this very small piece of the budget but it's where all the R&D is, and it's the easiest target, you know, and yet it may be the most important in a certain way. And I'm very worried about the future, and yet R&D is also seen as critical to the future of the U.S. economy and innovation and its, our performance. So you would hope that that would be protected and nurtured. R&D is part of the future. And we absolutely have to have a massive effort here to find these substitute technologies. We should be leaving no stone unturned. It, it, is, it is a, a top global national priority, not just for the future of the economy, but the, the planet itself. We've got to get out of the carbon cycle problem, and uh, R&D is a pillar of that. Can I ask you, Rafe, what's the role of government in this R&D? Well, the government is, the fact is, the private sector cannot do, or does not do, by its nature, much upstream, highly uh, risky R&D, very fundamental. That's the job of the government. That's why the gov we helped to create the Advanced Research Projects Administration Energy. And uh, that's a government role. That's at least, that's what all the economists say. You know, all the analysts say the government's key role is in R&D. Uh, and, uh, and to drive it through uh, in incentives as well, like pricing, but but it's worrisome because a lot of po politicians don't understand a the greenhouse the global warming problem or don't want to understand it and the role that R and D plays in that. So, you know, the last couple of years have been very mm, uh, there's a lot of people got discouraged because the uh, emergence of this denialist camp and its seeming success. And the easiest thing to get a consensus around is R&D. So maybe that's a place where we have to start over again to, to move forward. Well, you, you do see it parallels to um, what happened with uh, after Sputnik was launched and DARPA and, and Space Race. Yeah, but Sputnik was uh, competition. Right. It's Cold War, fear of the Russians drove uh, our response. You know, part of our response, I believe, was that President Eisenhower told the Pentagon, you will do what is known as DARPA. Because all the services, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, didn't want it because it threatened their, their uh, turf. And yet they established the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration, and you see which may be the government's most important, internet. Right. The, it stimulated uh, the economy. And well, yeah, but it, and it produced some of these magnificent technologies that uh, are either used by the military or by society as a whole. Uh, another question in the back. I was going to say, by the, I'm sure everybody here knows that 20 percent, you know, that discretionary budget spending area is 20 percent is practically the whole government, except for except for uh, not just it's not just R and D. It's 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 like all the essential right. functions it's of the government. State Department. You know. It's diplomacy. Agriculture. I mean everything. Yeah. You know, but. Uh, 
want to say as far as like governance, whenever I have questions, but as far as governance goes, one of the things that really interesting thing that's happened in recent years is that, like a very ancient truth has come out, which is that all democracies and all republics seem to have to carry two huge, huge burdens always. Which one is that the elites want to take over, they don't want 80, 90 percent of the power, they want 100 percent. And there's a certain percentage of the people that are just off the wall. Yeah, they're not stupid, they're not uneducated, they're, you know, if you're going to give the vote to everybody, you have to give it to them. And we're running into that now, and it has dragged the publics down in the past. You know, and, and, and this, isn't, this isn't just banks and corporations, I mean, this has ha happened to Greece and Rome as republics. But um, what I wanted to ask you about, I worked in the Texas State House for quite a while, and I was with the Corps of Engineers and uh, Congressional Relations, and we did, you know, the Corps of Engineers was the big engineering highway and they got put in charge of wetland restoration. It was kind of a stroke of madness or genius, you know, but they did a lot of coalition building. Mm -hmm. And so did the, in the Texas State House, I saw it too, you know, where you get, suddenly you get the hunters to line up and uh, people who wouldn't be environmentalists for a second, but, uh, but their water supply just got trashed by some, some oil well got out of control or something like that. It's how much luck have you had? I was just wondering if you describe some of the coalition building Exercises. Uh, the Corps of Engineers was particularly interesting. I thought the, the the people they were able to line up to. Well, it's a very good point about coalition building, and I actually think the sea level rise issue. You can see, begin to see coalition building because local governments are having to cope, at, at least with the planning stages, based on what estimates are out there for the rate and magnitude of sea level rise. And you see that in Florida, there's a four-state uh, government cooperative uh, program from Monroe County to Palm Beach, the, from the Keys to Palm Beach, it includes Broward where Fort Lauderdale is and Miami-Dade. Uh, and they are being assisted by federal agencies, NOAA, the Corps, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So to, you can see sort of government coalition building to cope with impacts there. and. Uh, gr and uh, plus the Florida Water Management Agency, South Florida Water Management Agency. So that's a really interesting experiment because they're really on the forefront of dealing with this. And uh, I th what, uh, what surprised me, and I didn't understand this, is that as local governments have to figure out what they're going to do to cope, that tends to bring a lot of people together who hadn't been at the table together before. So that's one way in which that occurs. I think the second thing that has to occur, and it has occurred somewhat in Washington, is you see large coalitions of business, environmental groups, and others trying to get something done on this. So there's that. Uh, so I don't think it works without a cross-section of society involved in trying to do something. The sea level rise issue, uh, you can see, you can see real estate, homeowners, chambers of commerce, uh, the core, insurance companies. insurance companies could be sitting around a table trying to figure out what they're going to do. Well, I think we're just about out of time. I wanted to thank Rafe Pomerantz for his, his thoughts thank you, and Dan, insight. Thank you, Dan, for your help. And um, uh, well, thank you for joining us at the Romy Forum. And uh, do you have any concluding thoughts? Or no, it's good to be here. Thank you. Okay.